Got to be fair about the air. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to a hot Sunday morning. With all the heat and humidity, the sound of fans, birds calling, The heart may be beating a bit faster to keep this body cooled. The breathing, do we hear the breathing? Feel it? With all of this, can it be Quiet, quiet. Still in the mind? Or rather, in the stillness, thoughts showing themselves quietly. As the wind breezes, the birds are calling, thoughts are arising. Thoughts about the heat, wanting it cooler, to watch, to watch it all arising, maybe connecting into the emotions, frustration or irritation, anxiety or pleasure. Can it all arise in hot stillness, hot, humid quietness? <clears throat> Maybe even for moments at a time, no thought arising, for brief moments. We may not know those moments because knowing is already putting words to it. What just happened to me? I had a moment of stillness. But as stillness manifests, Without thoughts about it, there is no knowing it. Just the blowing, the breathing, heart beating and birds singing, the skin sweating. Because we're using words. And you may say, well, what about these words? They bring the known into being. that is actually happening. And just as the talking need not close up the space of listening quietly, hearing the words need, need not close it up either. Just as bird song and fanning 
can be heard without closing into a narrow space of me and mine. That's the narrow space in which we live most of the time. Without realizing it most of the time. Because thoughts and sensations and emotions and pictures seem so real. And we don't realize that we're living in thoughts, pictures, and stories, and memories, with little touch of what's actually happening. So coming here together on this Sunday morning, not needing to say, even though thought says it all the time and, and urges to say it, has urgency to say, this is happening to me or to you. And with that, thinking divides the world. And each human being divided within themselves What I think I am, what I think I should be. What I don't want to think about myself or others. What I think others are, how they are, how they should be, how they should not be. And the situation in, we live, in which we live and work and socialize are we, in, are we in direct touch this moment? Or are we living in the past in what we think things and people and situations ought to be like? If only everybody would shape up a little bit. I've been thinking about this and probing into this a lot in recent weeks. This incredibly deep-seated, almost unshakable conviction that if we only wanted to, and particularly if others only wanted to, they could be different, more to my liking, more to my convenience, my agenda, my comfort, that we are freewheeling agents of our life, of our fate, of our interrelationship, who maybe with a little bit more meditative awareness could change and be more what? How do we want each other to be? How do we want circumstances to be? Doesn't it always come down to the way it suits me most, makes me most at ease? Comfortable. 
without conflict, etc. We have to look. I can't look for anyone else, but I can look here how it is for this human being who represents all human beings, not as a matter of choice or mission, but as a fact. We're all so unbelievably alike in the processes that govern life, human beings, cells, animals, stars. I said processes that govern. I did not say we are alike because each one of us governs ourselves. Because it has never been found to be so. Even though that's the conviction. The conviction without realization is that I can control things and people and myself. But where is this I to be found? Maybe in olden times, although I'm not, I've never researched it, there used to be more philosophizing about what this I is. I think, therefore, I am. Which is a very right on statement. Without thinking that I am, what am I? And more recently, as, as has come to my attention, a lot of brain research. People send me articles and books because they know I have an interest in the brain. Actually, my chief interest is to watch it here from, from responding and the transparency of responding to triggers that may happen to human beings like you and me. Transparently observing whatever can be observed in our responding to each other, in our desiring things and fearing things, and the emotions that well up with it all. Brain researchers are not necessarily, and I haven't found any that are, they may be, meditators who watch the brain from the inside, as it were, but come up with amazingly similar conclusions. Namely, there is no I to be found in this brain. I remember reading long ago that after Freud's uh, division of id and superego and ego, there was an, a real interest to locate these entities and agents in the brain with no success. What is rather being referred to is a com complex processes, brain processes, interacting, which there also seems to be agreement, most of which are not even conscious to a human being. We're not even conscious of most of the brain processes that are operating right here and affecting this amazingly, mysteriously intricate organism that we call me and mine and I. Brain researchers have tried to pin down whether there is somebody who makes a choice, who makes a decision, and have found for decades now that brain processes operate much earlier then a subject says, I want this, I choose this, I intend this. Something has already been stirring, visible on electrical current graphs, not beknownst to the decider, to the chooser, to the knower. So, the beautiful thing about findings like this, it seems to me, is if, it, if one can 
translated into our interrelationship with each other in which we assume time and time again with great conviction, great emotional intensity. It, if we or you only choose or chose to be different, you could. Or that you are doing this against me, whatever you're doing. And with a cutoff point, at the moment somebody says or does something, that's where the thinking and reacting starts, leaving out completely the infinite things that happened to the person who said and did what they did, to which I react as if this comes from you, against me, against us, against them. How, how can we get off this lethal assumption lethal for our relationships with each other and sort of fall into a more wide open space of really attending to ourselves and each other in new ways, maybe, maybe even unbeknownst to brain researchers. <coughs> and we talk about it a lot. And a number of people tell me, when I hear you talk about a new awareness to hear each other, listen to each other freshly, what comes up for me is, here she goes again, I can't do it. And then a comparison. Maybe she is better than I am, or they are better than I am, or I'm better than they are because I have some awareness. So, it's, it's difficult to say something because of the way the brain hears it, receives it, associates it, compares, frets, feels up or down depending on the moment. And it is, it is a fact, I think, to be seen to be so accepted, if you will, that unless there is some unself-centered presence and openness in this brain, it, this feels really like cavernous, empty, open inside. Unless that takes place, maybe not perfectly, but to, to a considerable extent, we cannot hear what someone else says. It's already been projected or interpreted according to the past traces in the brain, according to what I'm afraid to hear, what I want to hear. I can't hear. I hear the inner processes, but not awarely, but compulsively. And this is why when everybody has had this experience, whether in meetings or at car accidents, witnessing Everybody has heard it differently, according to their own agenda. And anxiety or anger, resentments. And the brain, ever busy to make a coherent story out of the moment-to-moment -moment happenings, puts a story together, and in that we live, and to that we react, and that we propagate. My story of what has happened to me, or what you are doing to me or to them, often with little relationship to what actually happened. What actually did happen? Were we there, present? I'm coming around to it again. Very hard to go by memory of what happened. Because the memory is so, memory itself unreliable because we forget. But it can only record what is being perceived. And what is perceived is usually slanted, prejudice impacted by one's own 
needs and anxieties, etc. Well, we'll have, in a little while, we'll have possibility for questions and discussion and comments. I'm not trying to push anything down people's throats or brains. <laughs> This is just offered as observation to be tested out at the moment here and in the long run. If maybe it occurs to one, what is really going on right now as I'm here getting agitated, triggers pushed? What is really going on? Am I really here? with no agenda and to see the enormous agenda that is being carried in human brains like yours and mine to get one's right, right share or be, yeah, you, you fill it in to get others to realize that I was right. Tremendous attachment to being Right. Not out of choice because there's no choose. It's an old pattern. If one isn't right, then one is liable to be punished or outcast, not regarded well, not as well as others. Also, this infantile fear of humiliation. Being shown or proven wrong is a tremendous discomfort for human beings like you and me. Because all one's sense or most of one's sense of security has been invested in having done right, not having made a mistake. And this shaky edifice is held on to for security. False security because somebody can get enough allies, lawyers, intellectual uh, capability to prove me wrong. So let's start from whatever is most vulnerable in oneself to be proven wrong not to be given free reign, not to get one's way, which one thinks, of course, is the right way. And begin to question, begin to question with a new mind, is that possible? Or is this mentioning an idea? It's not an idea for me. It is possible, not all. What is possible for human beings? And enough people confirm this to me. And we, when we meet together, sometimes after a long time, that indeed this is possible to see things in people and oneself as one is, with no need to defend, no need to brace, no need to protect. Therefore, no need to aggress. Because the space is wide open, the listening space. And what a relief. What a relief it is not to have to defend false assumptions about oneself and others, but to begin to see each other as one human, enormous, intricate process having evolved over millions and millions of years in incomprehensible ways, uncatalogable. And the computers will try to do it, but they will always lag one moment behind. Yeah.
energy that is habitually invested in human beings like you and me, in defending oneself, protecting oneself. And the moods that go with it when I'm attacked seem to be defeated. You name it. Incredible release that this energy can free itself by realizing the falseness of the assumption that energy flows freely and creatively and lovingly and wisely. some respects in the individual details of our life story, happenings, experiences. We're all different. So each one has to look for themselves. What is it right now that is so hard, so defensive, so clinging to my story? I can't let it go because it's me. If I let the story go, I let myself go. That's the feeling. It's not verbalized. This how, how the dynamics work and all the energy that is naturally in life to survive, if to perpetuate itself, has at one point in time or long periods of over long periods of time become invested in the idea of myself to survive at all costs. as me, as I know myself, or would like to see myself, would others, would others like to see myself, invested with raw life survival energy, which when this whole thing is questioned, can become released into pure life. serving imagery and stories and attachments to these stories, which is incredible and has to witness it for oneself. Maybe at a crucial moment of really becoming a little bit aware to notice, I don't want to be aware, I don't want to see that. I want to go on with me and my the idea of it. I don't need me leaving family possessions of it. It's, what it needs to do is one thing, but not coming out of an idea, just see it, the power, the overwhelmed, or nearly overwhelmed power of ideas about us and you and me and them. refrain from a part of the Tibetan book of the dead just popped into mind. I don't remember all the intricacies of the appearances of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and demons and uh, you name it, all of it being whispered into the ear of the dying or dead by the Lama. He tells what is happening. But then comes, without fail, this refrain. That too I don't remember verbatim. Behold that all of what has been mentioned, all that has appeared or is appearing now are just the productions of your own mind.
I would not want nobody to whisper anything into my ear when I die. On demand, not intending it or willing it or choosing it. It happens with this work of watching and questioning everything that appears so solid, so common sense, so dear to me, so necessary for my survival. Question it. Not get rid of it, not drop it, not yeah, renounce it, conquer it. No, we're not saying this. Although people tell me I do say that, but I don't. We hear with our loaded ears, brain, how to question and let the questioning and the energy that comes with a neutral questioning take care of the looking and discerning and discovering. Actually, I could say a little bit, just a few minutes, about our feeling, idea, and feelings that when we have difficulty with each other in the family, at work, wherever, living together. It's very important that we tell each other how we feel and what we feel about the others. Feel free to do that. Not repress it, not sort of swallow it. So the inner explosion eventually takes place from all the pressure. which the brain researchers tell us most of them are not even reaching the conscious mind. And likewise, how accurate, accurately are we perceiving the so-called other? To, to keep question, keep that question in mind as we may need to unload and, and hope for openness on both our parts. Because without that openness, we just entrench ourselves deeper in our positions, more protective, more feeling there's no communication, so forth. So, to, how, how well do I know what I feel? Or aren't there already all kinds of censoring mechanisms at work, that I won't tell them, that I can't tell them about myself. Or 
a sort of make up services to make it up a little bit. Look, look, look a little bit better in my own eyes and that of the other. Question. Look at it alone and together. It's, it's, it's very, probably a, a very deep well. And also, if someone does not want to talk at this moment, oh, yeah, let's just take this moment. We don't know how it'll be tomorrow. Does not want to talk, does not want to engage in telling how they feel. But just wants to sit there, walk there, eat there, sleep there like a muddy pool. Muddy, I mean not judgmentally, but with a lot of turbulence, upset, confusion. And listen carefully, not to how I feel, but just listen. Listen to everything that's appearing without doing anything about it. And maybe discovering a wonder of wonders that the muddiest pool can clear up again without having engaged in our conventional methods. Trying to clear it up, filter it out, talk about all the sediments that are swirling around. So can, can we give each other this enormous space? To be as we are from moment to moment. Disagreeable how it may impact each other. live with it like we live with the weather. What can we do? Of course, we can get air conditioning. Yesterday was, was very interesting, beautiful. Earlier in the week or whenever that was, we had dry, cool, sunny weather. It was clear, beautiful, easy to live with, and then hotter and hotter and more humid, and then all of a sudden clouds darkening and thunder and lightning and rain. Not so easy to live with. This mugginess, this darkness. I, I prefer it light and dry. Easy to live with, but what can you do? Here it is. And on, on leaving the house, somebody uh, called from the deck and said, wasn't that wonderful to have all of this rain and thunder and lightning? Now it feels so good, so, so clear, so, so fragrant. The earth and the foliage just dripping and fragrant with presence. And that's, again, easy to live with, but not to bank on that this is going to last. It doesn't. <laughs> Something will happen again that, it, that will be hard to live with. <laughs> Impossible to live with the corn of our life, impossible to live with most of the time. How do we live with it? The, the, the question putting it is very dualistic, but it needn't be in actuality.
Jody uh, uh, the illusion of the eye having control and kind of referred to process, multiple processes going on that we're unaware of that are influencing what happens. And yet there is, in some sense, a, a direct translation from the eye to some kind of input, some, a, a certain input to those processes. And though we may not have control, there's certainly some kind of connection. And we may not be able to find it in the brain, but it's there. I mean, we can raise our hand. There's that direct connection. And that was one of the experiments to have subjects raise the hand and at the moment they said, I want to raise my brain. There had already been uh, a lot of brain activity preceding that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, I mean, even so, there's this very direct relationship between them. Between what? You said the I. What is the I? What are you referring to when you say there is a direct relationship between I and how it impacts what, what did you, uh, what did, uh, impacts the body or impacts what we do? What is this, what is this I, this doing, controlling I? So you're saying a focal point, whatever that is, affects what this body does? Is, is that what you're saying? Is, um, or affects what, yeah, how it talks, how it behaves, reacts? A focal point is reacting? What is that focal point? from which direction uh, a reaction comes, or thoughts, or defensiveness. Well, the whole point would be saying consciousness, or consciousness in this moment. And in terms of perspective, that's defined by our bodies and, and the input that we receive. Um, I'm not saying that the eye is necessarily the instigator of, of that, but it's, it's certainly very closely related. The I now you're saying is consciousness. Is that what you? Uh, I'm, I'm saying it comes from consciousness. Hmm? It comes from consciousness. What is consciousness? Well, you get it. Point where I have to say I don't know. Well, is is that a cop out, um, or is there a looking? Uh, I mean, consciousness certainly is all I do know all the knowledge about uh, past experiences, memories, anticipations, knowledge. Uh, and if you follow this carefully, where did this knowledge come from? Where did these experiences come from? And you may find that you cannot make a separating line between my consciousness and your consciousness. They are so interrelated so that uh, People have said there is one consciousness, one whole consciousness, manifesting here, 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 here. So, a thought arises in consciousness, or a, a pattern is triggered, a hurt is triggered in consciousness. Where is this I? 
except that we talk this way and think this way. rather say thought because they already implanted here in the brain imagery of right and wrong, and superior and inferior, etc. I'm just picking that as an example. This discussion intrigues me because I'm thinking about the, a lot of it makes sense to me from a lot of different ways. You know, I'm thinking about a way in which um, we are ourselves despite ourselves. <laughs> I mean, there's a way in which what we think we are is one thing, but then there's a way in which I think we move through the world in patterns that are recognizable as individuals. Um, the way a person moves in, in, many, in many respects is recognizable and um, it's not unchanging, it's not permanent, but some things are, you know, change very little and, and continue to be recognizable. Our signatures are recognizable, our voices are recognizable. So, and in some ways it seems to me like, at least for myself, there's a lot of learning to be gained from a variety of uh, strategies that consciously or unconsciously people arrive at for living their lives, you know, and to look at one person's way of moving through the world and another person's way of moving through the world can be exciting. And so in, in that sense, there's something to celebrate in individuality. Um, and that's just a thought that arose as we were having that discussion. I don't know that it's an argument that anything that's being said. It's just a, it's just another way of thinking about it. Celebrate diversity and a variety, like you know, twenty thousand orchids. Yeah, and and to, and to appreciate. I mean, it's like that's a story. It's a way. It's a way that we all learn in the world. You know. But if, if we're not uh, totally occupied in defending our way against the other way, but there, there's an opportunity to sort of, oh, wouldn't it be nice to move like that? And then we do move a little like that because we admire it. Or look at that. Oh my God, look what that person did in that situation. Isn't that amazing? Wow, could I do that? And, and of course, you know, it would be an illusion to say you could just take it on. And yet, in some way, we let it rub off on ourselves, just as we learn language together, just as you're saying, it's like there's a shared consciousness. But, so there's something in a way that is uh, wonderful about the particularity of people.
exactly understand what you want us to unlearn about I. You know, I mean, I is three letters. Truth. It's an ego. It's a psychological slip of some kind. But, uh, what, uh, why do you think I said I want you to unlearn about the ego? Uh, learn about it. Watch openly, without trying to uphold it or put it down or get rid of it, just a, an open observation which it is true learning. So that was a misunderstanding. I say unlearn how we can. Mm -hmm. Things drop off on their own when they seem to be useless or wasteful or a burden. And even then they may not drop completely <laughs> in the processes like defense right. or, or projection right. or survival, right. 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 anxiety. But at the same time, there are differences. Yes. Was that the yeah. is, is what the I? The differences. The I is the thought that I am somebody, and the somebody is a whole story of remembrances and imagery that gets hurt, or whatever, you have to watch it. Or that wants to defend itself if it senses somebody is trying to get me out of there or is trying to make me get rid of it, then all kinds of defensiveness jumps up to watch that. And that's an amazing program of the eye to, to resist being questioned. So you're saying that when you have the awareness of the, of the story of Rashomon, the story of Rashomon, the murder where everybody saw the murder, and there were ten different stories of murder, the murder, that when you have this awareness that if you, if you literally have that awareness to um, any great extent, then you uh, become less defensive? Is that what you're saying? There's nothing to defend when you're not there as somebody who needs to maintain themselves. But see, it is not that I have the awareness. The I is, is not capable of awareness. It's only capable of thinking and reacting. Awareness is there when there is free, freedom from the I consciousness. We, we each see, we each see a, a given impact with, with and form different impressions from We each, you, you're back to this murder? I, I just like or to follow. Else. No, I'd just like to follow. Yeah. Yes, we each it's see. Murder, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We each see, we each see different stories. And so I don't see why the, what are you saying sees the different stories? You're saying that it's I that see no. one story and you see another story? As different stories are related, uh, described, there is the, the past experience at work which cannot see completely what is happening right. because it, it, it filters, it's like right. colored glasses. Right. But knowing that, what, 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 so? Well, knowing that may be, be a help to know and to question, is really my account accurate? I may not be accurate, which is already a big step, but that is not yet really being free of this. What else do you need to be free? Hmm? What else? What other component do you need for freedom? It has no components. Well, I'm using the word component in, in that one pre learning process. What other learning? It happens on its own. On its it, own. Yes. Right. It's not a product of the eye 
of thinking, of fantasy, of wanting. <clears throat> Those are all consciousness processes, brain process, thinking processes. But awareness is not. It's not a process of the mind. The mind is quiet, quietly listening in awareness. The fan, huh? When you were talking about how your body knows something before you might know that I would know that you're going to do something, it reminds me of um, poetry I've written about my, without knowing the things where I was in process, or that I did not know my life would change in certain directions, yet later I could see that another part of me just knew, you know, like I was anticipating something I did not already decide. And is, where does that come from? Do you, you know, I did not decide it, but I'm, oh, I was, you know, writing about other things. But I could see that I was writing about decisions I would make that I did not know consciously. Yes, yes. So where does where Well, you, you've described, you've described it. Now, what are you asking me? Where does this come from? Mm -hmm. I can give you an answer out of consciousness. And you say, well, is that awareness? I don't know. I'd have to, to really, we have to really be in, in contact and in touch to look at it. Intuition. Another yeah, word. Intuition, yeah. similar yes. to the idea where you have the brain activity before you move your arm. Is that the intuition also? I, I, I'm struck by the line here of thinking of the, the separation as being within what we call the self, or what we are thinking of as the self, or the, the tension, the antagonism. We are made parts of the self, intuition, of the unconscious, the conscious part. And Tony, I was thinking of this lovely process of neutral questioning within the parts of the self, and from what part, or who, who is the instigator? That's what the way I want to say that is how do I think about the, the one who comes up with the neutral question? Mm -hmm. How do I think about it? How do I think about the one who comes up with the neutral question? <laughs> <laughs>
so there may be some observed. We shouldn't have an axe to grind. For or against. It happens. Tony, I read one teacher that said, I guess in relationships, he was thinking not, he didn't say that for all one, he used the word not to. So you are in conflict with someone, and for some reason, this is thrown up into the mind. Not to. At the moment, you're already battling and defending. So what happens? Not to. Then. Those two words come up. Because just thinking we're not two, that's not enough. The question, what, what, is this what's going on right now? Me entrenched and seeing them as entrenched in their position? To sort of question into what's happening. And are we really two? And mind may say, yes, we are. <laughs> or, and, 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 uh, and, and proceed on that path. Or there may be a quieting down. Not to. What does that mean, not to? Beyond the words. But that's still good thought advice, which may have some through, effect, yes. Right. Maybe has a little bit different effect from, from, from saying, well, the hell, yes, we are two. You know? It's a different, two different thought processes. But in, in wondering, what does it mean not to? And sort of the mind falling quiet because it cannot figure it out. Can it? Can the mind figure out what does it mean not to, where there's here uh, 50 people or 30 people. It's all its logical uh, wheels. Uh, do they grind to a halt? What does it mean, not many, not two? And That doesn't make sense. Huh? <laughs> so you're still thinking. And thinking can't make sense out of this. But you, you proceed till thinking cannot dissolve this, resolve this, or answer it. Because after all, like people said, I, I move different from you. There, there are as many different movements in human beings as there are human beings. So it doesn't make any sense. What did they mean? And I respect the one who said this. There must be something deeper that the mind cannot grasp. And I'm not saying that this is all possible at the moment you're engaged in, in a professional or I don't know what uh, kind of a contact, interrelationship with someone. It must be a question it pursues, it doesn't let go. So that you find some time to sit with it all. I don't mean necessarily a full lotus position. What does it mean not to when everything speaks loudly? Two, three, four, five. Saying that this can only be achieved through quiet. Can it be achieved through thinking? No. Yes. Let's rather say, put it that way, not achieved through thinking. Okay. Not achieved. 
Because the other, when you say it can be achieved through quiet, then I'm going to try to achieve it by uh, being quiet. One hour, two hour, three hour, eight hours, devote my life to being quiet. And there's still this one who's quiet and all the others who are not quiet. There's still not this absence of division. Are there any rules in this work? Bitte? Are there any rules in this work? In which work? No, you can't find it. Yeah. The mind wants to, wants to have rules, wants to have guidelines. It's, it is so raised and conditioned. Well, other than that, if, if, if you don't have some guidelines, I don't think, at least I can't get the cancer. It's only by thinking that I get the cancer yeah. or by the absence of thinking. It seems to me like there's a moment of recognition that you're in your Involved in thinking. Yeah. yeah. When you really sort of bump into that, ah, oh, here it is. Here is that habit. Here is that moment of encountering and doing my habit and doing my thinking as I always do. It. Yeah. I'm involved in all those little groups. The, the, mo the moment that you recognize it, not think about it as an intellectual concept, you just sort of come upon it, like, oh, there it is. Then there's like a But is it um, just a picture you're making, or has this actually well, happened? This I moment of recognition. I mean, yes. That's, yeah. That's, I mean, it's not just a picture. It's something yes. But thinking will quickly busy itself with it. Could you say a little bit more what you would like me to I read that. I read that article. Yeah. <laughs> the, yes, I, I read. I just read an article. Yeah. Self-replicating memes, or I don't know how you sp uh, pronounce it, Mimi or Mame or whatever. Um, <laughs> Mimi is really very, very to the point. But um, you know, I had some some difficulty with that article. Uh, I haven't read the book because. It was still very much conceived from the outside. Mm -hmm. And to really be with an author these days, there has to be some communication from the inside. Mm -hmm. And some of this uh, self-replicating and needs uh, a brain to replicate itself. I'd rather uh, put it in how, what do I observe in myself? That we cling to ideas about my, uh, well, this thing comes to mind again, my ethnicity, my religion, my nationality, and how this can self-replicate among millions of people. Because we seem to want an identity to cling to, it makes us feel better, more important, more powerful.
And of course, this idea of me is, is totally pervasive, although it's, it's everywhere, not among the animals. We don't, I don't think so. And then there are some people who grow up uh, uh, American natives, uh, Hopi, or uh, tribes like that, and somebody can say the Japanese people who are trained not to identify with their individual self, but to identify with their state, with their company, <coughs> with their tribe. So then there is not in many individualistic mimis, but one uh, so social meme. Because we may go to war with, with others, defending ours. So this is that 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 meme of me being a separate, self-willing, self-acting, self-shaping entity has been very strong here, particularly in the West. Renaissance times so has replicated itself beautifully. But I don't want to get too much into the theory of it because then I get away from watching the important things what I'm identified with and therefore I cannot hear you because I'm so identified with my idea. It, it blinds, it shuts the ears. And then I picked up on your word watching. <laughs> Before. Yeah. Before I picked up on your description of each of us seeing things differently. So, see, I'm still trying to achieve. And, and, and it's very, very worthwhile to watch that drive to achieve because it really drives human beings away from just simply relaxedly being here. How to achieve. See, I don't, know that, I don't know that that is my ambition to relaxedly be here because my cat is. My cat doesn't worry about the past or the future. She's very egotistical. But, uh, so you're afraid of getting egotistical, egotistical like a cat? No. I'm but, saying but, in quotation. But, but, I, I would like to have, I mean, I, I, it's been, it's at least as an intellectual concept, I think it's desirable to live in the present moment. And my cat does. And a cat is not governed by uh, the past or she's not worried about the future. And she's got not a lot of good things going for her. But uh, she's not a level I want again. And you, 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 you can't be at the level of a cat. I don't think <laughs> you to be, though, either. Yes. But you're assuming, conceptually, that just being here relaxedly would mean sort of catting, <laughs> falling into a cat existence. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, beware of new conceptualizations and assumptions. You don't know how it is not to have ambitions or programs to achieve something, do something, get something done. Who told, somebody told me this uh, just recently yesterday. I always have to get something done, and then I feel good, but it's, it's, it's become a real obsession and compulsion. And to, to notice that and and maybe not go with it and see what happens. At first, like a withdrawal, you know, I gotta achieve something, I gotta get something done, because that's my existence, to get things done. And I'm not saying you shouldn't get things done, but listen to the hum of compulsion, this moment of the fan rotating. something about this topic without using words. Because one of the things that happens to me is that every time we start using words, it turns into concepts and thinking. And, uh, so you notice something. You notice every time somebody know, a, a concept forms, a very important discovery. You find out more about how this mind works. And I can assure you, oh, let me, let me tackle this for a moment. Because this should have come up maybe in the talk. 
I'm not saying quietness is all, or, or not saying anything, wordlessness is all, because we live as human beings with language, and unless we are living in a monastery, maybe a hermitage, because monastery has its own politics and, and, and interrelationships, uh, we are in need of communicating with each other verbally. So the question comes up, is there any rub off from the quietness of sitting, the openness of it, to listening and verbalizing something and the openness not immediately shutting down? And if it shuts down, I want to know why did this shut down? Right? What, what's going on? And I realize I'm getting very involved in something that concerns me, my security, my, my image, or whatever. So it's very important um, observation that I can't listen to words without conceptualizing and questioning out of that well, it's possible to listen to words in an open way, where the fan is still humming, the breath is noticeable, and the birds are heard. So that the horizon doesn't pull together. That's a tall order, it's a, it's a big question. But it's possible. Because. Yes, I was thinking when we were doing the contact. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the verbal can create an incredible mess and does and confusion. Because we're so, um, these stories and verbalizations hook right into our whole uh, organismic structure the glands, the muscles, the, the organs. So it's wonderful to have this opportunity to move without words. But you can watch. Is there now a concept arising? I'm really a pretty good mover. I'm getting to be. I should be a better mover. You know, a little thing, a little conceptlets coming up. And to just watch them. Because then it's already not so open anymore, because then I'm concerned with myself in comparison with others. I don't mean to that you have to do this. When the mind is open, it becomes transparent to its image making. But yes, this is the, the beauty of a retreat. People tell me this all the time, that you can exist and coexist without talking with each other and, and getting much more sensitive to, to each other. I don't mean sensitive just in a negative way, but Sometimes a real lovingness toward people you don't even know who they are, you have never talked with them. And here we're all moving together in this quiet week. Or the opposite can happen. You hate everybody because of ideas. I, I hate all these people who move like this. I, they shouldn't move like that. But it, it, it never stays. It, it, it flaps. It, it switches from one day to another. That's another thing to learn, is not to think that the state that is prevailing right now is going to last forever. It doesn't. It doesn't. Even though it seems that way. And even though sometimes we are trying to do our best to make it last, but things change. About what? Watching parts. Watching parts? No, watching parts. I'm sorry. Watching parts. It's, it becomes easier in setting like this uh, to watch your parts relatively, I would say. Like if I'm by myself in my own room, it is much more difficult to watch my parts.
watch my thoughts easily with just being with myself. So where does this question take you? Is it an open question? So that the next time you're by yourself, you wonder and, and, and listen and look? Or is it sort of a, a hassling with you can... Uh, it's an open question and maybe it's, uh, what I like to maybe say that uh, I like to watch my thoughts more regularly, but I do not get the setting like this. So if there's something uh, can be done about it, or uh, it's a selfish question in terms of if I could know there's some liver or some things that a group gives like this, I don't know what it is. Uh, I like to be in that kind of situation where I'm just with just my myself and I'm not able to do that. And that's my question of if there how can I do it? <laughs> I was going to huh? Just stay long enough and it may change. <laughs> but what came to mind when you were saying this is uh, once reading in some of the um, um, writings and dialogues of Ramana Maharshi, uh, somebody said, oh, while I was in Himalayas, I was really with it. Now, he used different words. And now that I'm down here in this ashram, it's not at all like it was in Himalayas. And Ramana says, if you had stayed one more day in the Himalayas, it also wouldn't have been with you. <laughs> of course, uh, uh, particularly if one is new to this, there may be some real newness energy. And maybe there is such a thing. I don't know, some people, many people claim that if there is a sitting together, there's more energy generated than if one sits alone. But, uh, if, there's, if there's openness here, what, what, what can there be more energy? It's not more energy, it's just energy to look, to tr make transparent. But of course, sitting here quietly, we don't, uh, if somebody else brought this up, we don't inter interrelate, we, we don't use words. I've been using a lot of them. But um, there's some saving of energy which may translate itself in awareness energy. May or may not. Because very often people report that the longer they sit, the more stuff really comes up that may be disturbing. And then how does one respond by saying, the heck with sitting, I don't like this. I don't want to question myself. It's too insecure or too painful.
Last question. Uh, yeah. Uh, in your uh, talk today, um, I think I heard you uh, describing the eye as a conditioned process. Um, how it's you know, conditioned by our environment, uh, by um, people in our environment, and, uh, and then also by ourselves, how the mind conditions the body and the body conditions the mind into forming this uh, strong opinion of, of self. And um, I thought I heard you in your talk um, mention, and I don't know if you use this word, but the unconditioned, and how in sitting, uh, and I would assume other awareness practices, that the unconditioned can be experienced and even maybe felt as um, touching freedom or uh, a sense of uh, a sense of freedom. And I guess my question is, uh, can can that be cultivated? Can the unconditioned be cultivated? Is, is sitting um, a way of doing that? awareness in our daily life, a way of touching that. How did you find out? By experimenting with it. I did not use the word unconditionally. I don't think I did. I may have said at one point that we can only really hear each other what we're saying when there is some unself-centered. The unconditioned in it again is a concept of thing that no one wants to, to call it. It is not cultivated because it has nothing to do with the I. The I wants and wants conditions. It's when the I is in abeyance that it seems as though the conditioning is unfair because it's free and present. Thank you.